Ya te lo moví aquí, o sea que te lo atreví. Ok, welcome everyone. This is um, one of several on-the-fly lectures that we offer here at Design Media Arts, which are, we are lucky to sometimes have great artists come to Los Angeles and we snatch them to come to um, DMA and give a lecture. So, um, as you know, Pablo uh, Balbuena has, a, this, today I'm, I'm introducing Pablo Balbuena, and he has right now a show at Young Projects at the Pacific Design Center. The exhibition is called Presentism, Light as Material, and he's in the show together with some of our current MFA students as well as some alumni and other amazing artists. So I strongly recommend for you to be able to, if you can go, go to see the show. It's, it's wonderful, including James Turrell, of course Rafiq. Hi, why am I? Hey, me. <laughs> I'm too tired. <laughs> but anyway, it's going to be, and Casey, uh, it's, it's fantastic show. So the best way for me to introduce, I looked at so many ways to introduce Pablo. And in his side, not only Pablo creates amazing artwork, but he writes so concise and poetically about his work that I'm just going to read the text that, to me, describes his work so beautifully. Pablo Valbuena develops artistic projects and research focused on space, time, and perception, born in Spain and currently based in the south of France. Some key elements of this exploration are the overlap of the physical and the virtual, the generation of mental spaces by the observer, the dissolution of the boundaries between the real and perceived, the links between space and time, the primacy of subjective experience as a tool to communicate and to use the light as prime matter. These ideas are mostly developed site-specific, are mostly developed as site-specific, formulated as direct response to the perceptual qualities, physical conditions, and surrounding influences of a certain location or space. This body of work has been presented in public and private institutions by annuals and galleries in the form of exhibitions, site-specific commissions, and large-scale public interventions throughout Europe, Asia, and America. And again, there are two pieces at Young Projects that you can view, and there are site-specific projects, quite beautiful. And um, when I was looking, of course, at Paul's site, he wrote something beautiful about the show itself. And it is a quote by Wittgenstein that says, there is such a thing as the impression of luminosity. So it is an honor to introduce Pablo Valbuena. Thank you. Well, thanks, for, thanks to Rebecca. Thank you very much for the invitation and the, the nice introduction. Um, I'm going to, I would like to speak not only about my, my work and, and the projects I, I developed uh, recently, but also about some, some ideas behind it um, that I think uh, maybe even uh, since you are, most of you are uh, uh, already artists or studying uh, for that, uh, I think it, it's, they are probably even more, more useful uh, to know or to be aware more a bit about the process of, uh, of thinking behind the work um, apart from just seeing the work. Um, most of the material I sh I'm, I'm going to show you is, is documentation uh, in photographs or, or video. And uh, this kind of work is very experiential. So it's really, most of the time it's quite difficult to transmit what you really can can feel when you are in the space with these installations. So, uh, well, since I, uh, there is this amazing uh, show put together by Paul, uh, if you have the chance, I really encourage you to, to go and, and see it. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about light. And, and I'm really interested in, in, in light, not trying to think about video or projection, not about, about the frame, but think of it about light. 
And light has always been a, quite a mysterious thing. Uh, it has been always linked to, to supernatural events, to religion. Um, it has always, historically, the, the, the study of, of phenomena like, like eclipses or, or the sun, the moon, the, the stars, mm, they are, they have, light has always been, the study of light has always been linked to, to improvements or to in, in, in terms of the history of knowledge, to big improvements like uh, this, the study of these phenomena in astronomy, for example, lead to uh, understand how uh, the planetary scale and how we relate to that, that we don't live in a flat world, but we live in a planet that actually moves in uh, very fast. And uh, this is, for example, this is a this is a this, the shadow, the lunar umbra, the shadow of the of the moon, as photographed in a in a solar eclipse in 1999, from the from the from space, and. And well, if, if you would be in the in the center of that shadow, you would be uh, watching a, a full eclipse. This is a, a, a shadow that moves on the surface of the Earth at 2,000 uh, kilometers per hour, so quite fast. Um, and I'm interested in in this in how light has influenced this this kind of of knowledge, not not just in terms of uh, what I was well, mentioning in astronomy, but also like, for example, right now in quantum theory, uh, the, the spark that also started all the research in quantum theory, it, it's also related to, to how light behaves. So what is light? What light is, the official definition is that it's an, an electromagnetic radiation, it's a form of energy. It's made of particles, but behaves like a wave, that's, that's uh, kind of division made to try to explain something that it's not yet fully understood, how light can be at the same time a particle and a wave. And, and it's surprising to see that light right now with all the science and all the tools to, to investigate, it's already quite an unknown thing. Uh, light is something that makes things visible but it, it is, it's a medium, it's something that it's in between, it's invisible itself. It has a certain kind of memory because when it reflects, to, uh, it reflects into an object and then bounces and gets into our eye, it, it is already registering and uh, sort of saving the, the, the wavelength of that object so we perceive the, the color, for example, of that object. It's nearly everywhere and, and Something that is really uh, interesting about light is, is the scale. Uh, the scale in terms of it travels, we know that it travels very fast and very long distances, but there's something about the, the scale of light that we've, when, when we see, when we turn on a light or, or we uh, are in presence of a light event, we understand that event as something that it's occurring at that moment, so there's no delay. Uh, it's like the maximum speed we can we can achieve, but when, for example, we are watching stars and and we see at night one star, I really like this this idea that this star that is maybe thousands of light years uh, far away, maybe when you, we are seeing it, it already had disappeared because uh, it's so so uh, far away that even light uh, to travel that distance would, may take thousands or millions of years. So all these things, no, all, these, all these issues make, make like quite a, a, still a strange thing. This is the, the visible uh, spectrum of, of light, what the, the part of energy that we are actually seeing as light, which is, as you can see, really tiny. And, and that is divided in, in all the, the colors depending on the, on the wavelength. Um, so basically, this diagram kind of suggests how uh, reality, in a way, or the physical reality is composed of, of a lot of different things, and we think that when we see, we are already kind of uh, uh, grasping or, or understanding reality, but I think with this kind of, of diagrams, 
also you start thinking like if what what percentage or what uh, slice of reality we are actually seeing and, and you realize that there's a lot that we are not seeing uh, there's something very enigmatic and, be and elusive about the the phenomena in space produced by by light this is um, a description by by René Descartes the the uh, the, uh, uh, the rainbow that it's it's when we see a rainbow uh, it's definitely something physical is we can tell if it's uh, in front of of a, of a certain mountain or it's uh, after the next mountain you, you can place it physically but uh, but for example when you move the the rainbow also moves or if there's somebody else that it's 20 or 200 meters away the the rainbow that he or she is seeing is different than the one you are seeing so although still being something very physical that you can place in time and space is something that you cannot grasp and it's relative and this kind of objects producing objects i call them objects but they are uh, strange things uh, uh, they are relative, no? and, and I think this kind of phenomena put in question uh, the physicality of, of reality, and that's that's the part that mostly interests me. Philosophy has has always been uh, very interested in inside in the process of vision. The the first theories of of vision were were elaborated by an ancient Greek philosophers like Empedocles and later developed by Plato or Aristoteles. And it's, it's interesting to see how they were thinking about, about the, the sense of sight as, as a fire that we, we have in our eyes and it's, uh, it's emitting rays, you know, like kind of lasers uh, coming out of the eyes that are meeting the objects and that's producing vision which is actually the opposite that, that it's happening. But um, it's interesting to see how they gradually later become more accepted this, that it's the other way around. No? The, the rays come into our eyes and, and we interpret uh, them as, as images. But um, this, this sense of, of sight as something that you do consciously, I think it has to, be, has to, de has to do a lot with, with this impression that we have that, that we are uh, that it's uh, probably quite uh, uh, natural to think that we emit this race because when we see seeing is part of it's, it's kind of a part of thinking no? when when we fix our vision into something is because we are trying to decipher it or trying to uh, to understand how it works so there is a kind of active uh, action in, in seeing um, I don't want to to get to deep into like philosophical terms, but I, th I, I, th I thought it was interesting to, to, ins yeah, to quote, for example, this, this, this quote from, from Henri Bergson, uh, which is an author that uh, uh, at the time he was, he was writing, uh, kind of uh, advanced a lot of things that later had been, had been very, very developed for like he was really influential to to Deleuze and all the all the theory about film and cinema and all the te all the texts he wrote about about film and you he he has really interesting thoughts about um, in matter and memory but also in, in other books like creative evolution where he's uh, well there's for images merely a difference of degree and not of kind between being and being pe consciously perceived. And in this text, he, there's, there's a very interesting thought uh, about how he's kind of saying that uh, there's no really difference between image and reality, that the image that is generated in our retina, or our retina is qualitatively the same as a produced image. This is this is very very interesting because it, it's like saying that 
it's like interlacing, interlacing reality with perception and, say, and s saying in a way that they are in the same realm, that they, they, don't, they are not different. And, well, he, he, he uh, writes a lot about different things, but basically he talks about vision as a, also as a part of perception, uh, sorry, uh, as a part of perception as a part of action. So it's interesting how he thinks that uh, if perception is um, actually the same thing as reality, how, um, how actually perception at some point can influence action more than reality itself. And this is something that uh, could be, or f from my own point of view and my own practice is, is really important, that it's not that much important what is actually there, it's more important the mental image, or the perception you have of it, and how you build it uh, mentally, the subjective view of, of that object or that space. Um, so this, this kind of leads us to, to a point where uh, image could be reduced in a way as, as, as something as basic as light. And I like to think about painting for example, or any other medium to, to generate images as a, as a transformation of a surface to generate an image. It's, this is a 37-year-old uh, painting from, from a cave in the north of Spain. And, and it's basically uh, just somebody blowing red pigment on, on a hand. It's a, it's a, probably is the first stencil uh, uh, that was made. No? And I, I, I like to, I see, I can imagine, I don't know, that maybe they were producing these, uh, this looks very similarly in the way it's produced as a, sh as a shadow. No? And I'm really interested in, in this idea of just by adding pigment to a surface, being able to, to not only to change the quality of that surface, but how the light reflects on that surface and generate an image out of it. So in the end, it's like thinking of painting as light. And this is something that it's, it's really attractive to me. This is, um, this is basically the same thing. It's pigment on a surface. The, the only, well, it was done uh, quite after that, so I'm, I'm making here a big, a big jump in time. But this is a detail of, of this, uh, this painting by Monet, the, the Cathedral of, of Rouen. And in this, in this painting, actually a series of paintings that were developed uh, through w like one year and w a bit more than one year, he was painting this same uh, architectural uh, object at different uh, times of the day, different seasons, different uh, uh, sunny day, day with clouds. And in a way he was, I think it's a very beautiful um, materialization of this idea of, of light into painting. And in this case, even Monet probably took it much farther, uh, working in time with it and, and kind of compressing a, 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 a wide range of time into, into something very much more uh, focused. Probably another, another example or another, um, uh, yeah, another idea that, that would help to understand this idea of, of making images or transforming surfaces uh, and linking it just with with light is the all the use of uh, of these devices in the Renaissance to to actually uh, understand how how perspective how objects how how vision works and that usually require a bidimensional plane where where things that are fixed uh, be the contour the shape or or the and these optical elements for me are also like a kind of an interesting uh, sort of mm, indication that, that uh, the way of seeing has to do 
uh, totally with the way we, we represent, uh, not just in terms of perspective, but also in terms of light and shadow, how, how light and shadow works. Obviously, well, there's, there's a lot being said about how uh, optical, al optical devices were being used for, uh, by, by painters to actually uh, understand better how reality works, no? like, uh, like mirrors or lenses or the camera obscura. I've talked about how light or can be interpreted on a three-dimensional surface, like how painting, for example, could be in a way understood uh, as just trying to mimic how light behaves and just trying to to mimic what, how we see reality into a three-dimensional plane. But all, light has a also a very important, um, important uh, role in how we uh, how we perceive a space. It's really, it's really uh, a very elaborate process, but it, it's simplified to when we enter a, a space, the different uh, intensities of light reflecting into surfaces and how they, the contrast, how, how they, it changes on, on different planes, it makes us realize how, uh, how space is uh, formed and actually how we can, and how we can move uh, in it. It's, it's really uh, affecting our own actions in that uh, space. These are, this is a, a set of photographs by Sol Witt where he is basically lighting a sphere from, from all its possible uh, angles with, with several lights. And he studies the different uh, shadows and lights that are being produced. This, this kind of, this image reminds me also a lot like this kind of academic exercises of drawing uh, uh, a sphere and its shadow and and seeing how and realizing uh, or starting to realize that light is not as simple as just uh, uh, light and shadow no? that you have a lot of bounces you have a lot of reflections and um, it's it's quite amazing the amount of process we subconsciously do when we are watching, when we are just seeing, and when we are perceiving a space. And it, what is amazing is that all this process is totally automatic, and we don't we are not even conscious about it. But the 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 way we we see a space, it's really it's really complex. And the interesting part is that using light or kind of I would s like making an intervention into light, hacking light in a way, you can get in between reality and perception and start to change what is, what is going on there. Um, this is a, a little piece that I did in, in 2010. And basically following a, a similar uh, way of working than the than the previous uh, the previous image, it just by projecting uh, gradients of of light of white and, and black into these these uh, round columns, and make them coordinate uh, move coherently and coordinately, uh, like uh, the the the, um, the the impression when you would see this this situation is that there was a light that was actually kind of circulating around all these pillars, no? So by a very simple action, which is just uh, projecting this gradient into these, into these columns, you are, you, it's very easy to trick the brain on how the brain is, is seen, and suddenly it generates a situation that not only is difficult really to do, like, you, like a light uh, floating in a space, but uh, so, uh, and what is incredible is that the brain very quickly tries to complete the the situation, and and even uh, he the the brain tries to be it doesn't matter it tries to be deceived. You know, uh, uh, perception it's amazingly convincing, no? and um, the another aspect that it's important is how how also. Um, 
the, the aspect of time, of movement, uh, probably that, that this piece wouldn't work uh, as if, if it would be fixed. But when you add the, the, the notion of time and the notion of movement, this idea of the brain completing it, it's, it multiplies. So I've talked about how light is, is totally, uh, is fundamental for the definition of, of space, how light uh, also is fundamental for the definition as, as image or image could be understood just could be understood as a modification of a surface and so it produces an, an image and I would like to just present briefly a, a couple of uh, uh, references that are historical back in time and that I think they have to do a lot with with uh, with a lot of practices that are happening right now that relate to space. And what is, what is sometimes strange to me is that uh, right now we have a lot of focus on, on technology and on the medium itself, but, um, and we think that, you know, uh, all these ideas are absolutely new. And what is interesting to me is that, you know, looking back a little bit, it's really clear that uh, practices that have mixed perception, uh, light, uh, space, the movement of the viewer, um, it's, they are not that new and there are very good examples and very interesting examples of, uh, of these. Um, one of these perceptual spaces, this is the Santa Maria Preso San Satiro in, in Milan. Uh, it's it's a, a church uh, by Bramante, and what is interesting about this this trompe-l'oeil is that um, there's a close. Uh, it's not just a painting that was done there, but it, it has a close uh, or one of the closest uh, links with the architecture itself. Um, what is interesting about this this church? It was there was actually a, a functional limitation. The, as you probably know, in the, in the Renaissance, there were all, these are a couple of images of the, you can realize that what, what it's just at the back is just flat, it's a painting. These are some examples of, of uh, floor plans of Churches, in this case, some some Peter projects for some Peter, uh, where the the cross is very present all the time, and and what Bramante uh, does in in Santa Maria Preso San Satiro is, uh, is instead of building, uh, there was a, a road that was uh, crossing the back part, an important road in Milan that was crossing the back part of the of the church, so. Uh, at some point they realized that for the size of the church they wanted to build and for the distribution it, it was not possible to extend the, the church to that to that uh, extent. No? So they were blocked and they couldn't uh, do the, the, the cross uh, floor plan. And what it, for me this project has, has quite some interest because it's, it, it responds to also to a kind of a function or a problem. So br what Bramante did basically is instead of building physically the cross he, he or the cathedral in that uh, uh, optimal shape, what, what he did is, is basically building it uh, uh, perceptually. So when you enter the, the, the church, you, you have the impression that, that it's working that way. This, this project, for example, has a very interesting mix between uh, this these two ideas uh, we were, uh, I was presenting, like how uh, light in a space is is fundamental to understand that space, but and painting, no? it, it has both both elements in the sense that uh, you can tell that in the in the painting itself he's mimicking all the textures, all the not all, not just all the textures and colors, but also how light behaves uh, on the real surfaces. And, and just because probably there are the openings of the cathedral are quite controlled and there are certain, uh, well, it's, it's, it's an environment with natural light, but 
control, quite controlled light, he probably could, uh, he, he managed to, to mimic these qualities of light in the, in the painting in a, in, a, in a way that at some point they merge no? and, and, and they are not that different between uh, reality and the, and the painting. In this sense of, of working with light, I, I would like to 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 introduce a, a project I, I a small uh, well not a small but uh, an installation I did for uh, at the mattress factory in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's it's an kind of an artist run museum uh, where they have well they have been working for for a long time and they are especially focused on site specific work. Um, and and this is I wanted to show one uh, just excerpt of the sorry because I'm I'm going to have to change between uh, the the presentation and the videos hopefully it's not very problematic This this piece works uh, specifically a lot with with these qualities of light and shadow rather than I have other pieces that work that are more focused on drawing on the idea of a structure of the space. This is the opposite. This is works more with uh, with the chiaroscuro with the the contrast of light and how to to generate light and shadows. are quite dark pieces so they are a bit difficult to, to document but you can see here the the real space which is basically a room with with two blocked windows and what it for me is interesting about this piece is that there's a mix between the light that it's being projected in the in the real space that it's functioning actually as light that it's reflecting on the real surface like basically in this part and then through the windows, uh, I work with a more traditional video uh, idea in the sense that I'm using them as frames. So what is projected right now inside the window, it's, it's uh, basically it's just as a video that it's using the, the frame of the window, but considering your position in a space. And it's, yeah, it's it's difficult to explain. Uh, it's a bit, um, as I was saying before, it's it's really these kind of works are quite are really experiential. But um, so this is this is a part that kind of was showing and and this. This understanding of light and of video as light, I think, uh, in my work is 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 very very important. And um, the, what is important, I think, it's the transition between both. How you can use uh, uh, video as a as something that is happening inside a frame, and something that is actually happening outside the frame in reality, and actually make that connection seamless. And and the the, the the feeling that that's a real space is quite strong. So in that sense, it's, I think it's 
very related to to the to the project of Bramante in the sense that there is this this similar idea of making seamless the virtual the representation of the of the actual space with the real space that is actually there. There's another type of space I would like to talk about. Is the the panorama? This is a, an image from a from a panorama panorama mesdag in in the Hague that was that was done I think in the 19th century. So it's not one of the oldest, but uh, it's still open. So it's you can if you go to the Hague you can you can visit it, and it's quite an interesting experience and this this kind of uh, works they they use certain mechanisms that are very interesting in terms of perceptual spaces one of them is that they are most of the time well i think you can yeah probably you can't but so i'm, I'm kind of uh explaining uh how you can you access uh this is uh like a little mm, platform where you see you can walk or all around this inside this platform and you access actually from from some stairs so you go up through a kind of a tunnel and you appear in this this kind of a space that it's beautifully lighted with natural light and you have all around you this 360 degree painting of a, of a location of the dunes in 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 the Hague, and, and this this was used at the time to 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 suggest a kind of trip, no, a virtual trip where people could see cities or could be could see places that w were actually far away or that at that moment or in or they wanted to to yeah to for some reason to make them. Uh, visible or important or there are quite a lot about battles for example about famous battles this is more this one is more uh, maybe simple in the se in the sense that it's uh, it's done for a location that is not far from here um, but so what is what is interesting for me is that the different uh, these mechanisms these actions to to make it uh, to make it to, to make you lose the the feeling of what's the what part is the real and what is the what is not so for example in the in the close range they always use uh, real objects they use real sand uh, as you can see the upper part is kind of overhanging so the you would see the painting and the sky going up and uh, the the view will be framed by that plane that it's kind of closing so you don't have an idea of looking into a frame even uh, your view is is totally framed no? but the way they frame it is very is very smart there's also this um, the fact that most of these panoramas have natural light coming in so this added uh, 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 an impression that the that the panorama was actually changing as the light changes so you would have at different times of the day, you would have different uh, different experience of the same of the same panorama. And something that it's also important is that you actually can move. Uh, your body can. Your body is in a space. You are not on on s on a dark space as a, as in cinema where your your body is still and you are transported through a frame to another time on on a space. This is actually working also with your body and with your peripheral vision you you always have the feeling of you can move and you can and it makes sense because you are looking at the other part of the of the city if you're looking at the sea you go back and you see the the city or the other way around if you look at the at the center it's very interesting how these panoramas were actually produced uh, if you look in the center of this uh, bungalow you have uh, a, a, a glass cylinder and that glass cylinder is something they were using to to 
uh, actually draw the, the or translate the panorama from reality to the to this virtual uh, space. Uh, what they were doing, the, the painter in this case, was uh, uh, sitting down with the head in, in the middle of that uh, glass cylinder, so it would be surrounding him, and that cylinder would be placed in the in the real space of the dune, and he would start uh, tracing the the landscape he was watching and rotating her his uh, his. Um, uh, head so keep tracing the 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 360 degrees and that uh, that cylinder later would be overlapped with paper and traced from the the glass to the paper and then the paper would be unfolded into a planar surface so that surface would would be possible to to be matched with the actual uh, 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 flat surface of the canvas. No? So this process, I think it's quite uh, of, of taking reality, representing it and taking it back to the to a sort of virtual environment. I think it's really, for me, it's really inspiring. I, I can see a lot of uh, ideas here that, that could be could be very, very interesting to to develop. In this sense, um, I will show also a video of a uh, of an installation that is working also with the, the Trump LA, but all, I think it addresses also some of the topics I was talking about in, at the panorama. This is a this is an old slaughterhouse in in Madrid. It was the biggest. Uh, Laura House in, in the city in the 19th century, I think, and it was abandoned, and later it was, uh, actually it was, there was a fire inside, so it was burnt, and, and they recently, some years ago, it, they transformed it into, a, into an art center, so and this space specifically is used for site-specific interventions. Um, this this work was basically just projecting on that space. It had a very clear axis. So what I uh, try to do is to to think about how this space could be uh, extended in a way, or suggesting that that this yeah that actually this the the limit of the space was in a way cannot be limited. This work is playing much more with the structure, um, but there are certain elements that may be related to the, to the spaces I was showing, like, for example, this idea of, of being uh, the, the body of the movement, is the, the movement of the body, sorry, is, is really affecting the way you perceive the work. Also, this idea of being surrounded, like, it's not that you are focusing your vision in one place, but actually uh, it's, it's really something that, it's a trunkle like that really is uh, covering all your, your vision. And something that also, I think it's important in this piece is the, and it, it's similar to, to what uh, I was talking at the panorama, is this, um, this point where, for example, you can see here that uh, the lines are projected on the real architecture, and at some point uh, th the same lines are continuing in, in the flat projection on the wall. And that, just by that link between both, uh, the, the, it's like the sand that was starting uh, as physical, and then at some point it becomes just painting. No? But the, f the, the just giving really little hints to, to our own perception, the, uh, suddenly the, the, the brain itself establish uh, a, a continuous link. So there's no, no seam between, between reality and representation. And this kind of 
uh, let's say trick or illusion it's also used this used here no with the light being projected first on the physical pillars and then just being projected as a as a drawing there were other elements on, of this work where the actual back wall at some point was just slightly moving a bit so it was really not very it's not it was not obvious but it added a, a certain sense of instability to the space like like the whole room would be sort of advancing in a way all these pieces are something that it's really important for me is that um, they are developed uh, site specific so um, most of, of these projects uh, respond to to how the space is experienced how it is circulated um, and I, I really take a lot into consideration how how people would kind of not live but how how they engage with with the space that that's really really an important part of the of the work I'm going to to show another uh, well another kind of uh, possible reference and a project that it's very different than well I'm not sure if it's very different but uh, it's not uh, using projected light it's using reflected light we were talking before about the how uh, <coughs> painting could be understood just a way of of changing the plane to to make light reflect in a certain way there are two extremes with light you have transparency where you have all light or visible light uh, passing through a glass for example or you have total reflection no? and this is another this is the the hall of mirrors at the chateau de versailles and it's another example of of a space that uh, when you look at it uh, if you see the the floor plan there's a part that is on the on your uh, right side that is totally there are windows it's facing to the to the garden and it's totally transparent and the other is totally opaque and it's actually uh, it's it's massive it's part of the it's already part of the building so the the structure of that of that of that hall of that gallery is is on if you if you look at it uh, architecturally it's totally symmetrical and and the, so the physical in a way the physical uh, structure of that room is transparency at one side and opacity at the other but the perceptual uh, structure it's totally different it really feels just by placing mirrors at the opposite side as the as the glass as the transparent glass suddenly uh, there's a, a, gen a multiplication of the space that totally makes you lose the, the impression of the of this opacity that it's actually there and this idea of using mirrors in that in that direction l leads to this uh, work which is <coughs> it's a place where I'm using these mirrors to sort of deconstruct perceptually a space and sort of rearrange elements of the space so so the, p the, the there's a kind of it's not easy to to understand what is going on in that room um, this is basically uh, two, uh, two planes of glass of mirror sorry uh, arranged so the you can see here a, a schematic of the structure <coughs> so basically what is happening is that you enter in the room and you you are always perceiving the room through this system of mirrors um, the point of departure here was that the it was a white cube but the only element interesting in that room was the was the ceiling this is a uh, actually an image of the empty room and so I wanted to work with the ceiling in a way and suddenly appeared this idea of of unfolding the unfolding the 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 room itself so the 
in a way the upper part it's like it's tricky to explain I think you can you can see that if you are just right there on the lower part of the room your vision would would uh, be reflected in the, f in the first mirror then in the second one you would see the upper part of the room but you would see it inverted so the the ceiling becomes slower and then reflects again on the back and comes back and it's already inverted so and you have this this structure of the room where you enter and it seems to be a much longer room the uh, suddenly the the ceiling of the room has became uh, part of the floor and you actually see yourself in a very long distance so there's a kind of uh, notion that there are there's obviously a reflection there at the seams of the of that space there were also being generated some interesting spaces where you would even feel vertigo like looking down at, at, at that the structure of of mirrors This, this piece is, is in, the, in the same way working with light, but instead of, of thinking about light as emitted light, it's just working with, with light in a, uh, just reflecting light. And um, there's, there's something very interesting about the machines itself to produce light, like projectors or, or, uh, or spotlights that they kind of work as inverted perspectives. Uh, when you, you take a projector and you project into a space, it's like, uh, it's like kind of an inverted eye in a way, or, or the system is similar to the, pro to the perspective projection system, but kind of inverted. I find this quite amusing. Um, well, I'm... I'm uh, kind of would like maybe to, to introduce maybe a couple of more projects and, um, and maybe we can jump to, to some questions. Just this is um, some of my early work, uh, which was the, the, the augmented sculpture series and it's It's a work that uh, started, the, the actually the piece at, at, the, at the exhibition at Young Projects, it's, it's related to this piece, but in a different way, because uh, this is just a unitary element, and the piece at Young Projects is actually separate elements, and I play with this idea of separate things that are interpreted in a different way. But this, this sculpture was kind of the first work I did uh, uh, like a first installation uh, in the context of, of art that uh, I did and uh, it was it was really trying to think about a sculpture in instead of working with volume you define a volume and you define a sculpture uh, even working with emptiness or or, or mass or but you you in the end you are just working with the space rather than working with the space i was interested in working with time so i projected these planes that were that were slicing the the sculpture in, in different ways so the cross section was was kind of the the important part of it rather than the the volume itself so the volume that was positive or negative was more important than the the full thing or this other part of the sculpture where where it was just like a time lapse of itself uh, overlapped in the in the sculpture um, after a, a while of working with this piece i um, i started trying out what would or trying what what would happen if what was happening when i took out the the sculpture and it turned out to be nearly more more interesting the fact that I was not generating the the support of the of the sculpture, but I, I was rather working with architecture that was already there. That suddenly um, brought uh, more layers of meaning to the work, and 
And right now it's actually, it turned out to be like what most interests me, this idea of working inside specifically and arriving to a place and just working with the elements that are there. I think that even though that could be limiting in terms of what kind of works you can do because you don't have maybe the amount of time that you would like, but uh, it's quite, uh, whoops, it's quite, uh, yeah, I think it's in terms of uh, results, it's quite, uh, I think it's much better. I think the, the results are much more interesting. These are all the projects in with the same idea in larger scale developed in, in 2008. And this is a bit what I was talking about. This is kind of the first tests I was doing when with this same idea of altering space with with just this is was just a as you can see a really terrible corner of of, of an <laughs> industrial space. My one of my the, the first studios and and uh, and well, I was just just trying what 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 were the possibilities of really changing the space, just uh, projecting lines. No? Later, I've been working quite extensively into into this idea of. I think I have a video of this corner. It's not this one, sorry. Oh. Well, I'm going to show the one. I don't have that one. This is a, a different kind of a space. It's just a corridor on a, on a, um, inside a, the house of a collector. And... Um, There's something also about the rhythm of these works that is very important. Mm, I try to to leave space for the viewer to to reflect or to think on what what they are seeing. Uh, I don't like to overwhelm the the sensory experience, so so people can actually stop a bit and and reflect. Uh, I started in the augmented sculpture in the first works. I started using sound, for example. But uh, and color actually, even if you don't believe it. <laughs> but uh, uh, I quickly realized that it was um, for the for my intentions in terms of what I wanted to to work with. It didn't make much sense like working with with sound. It was not really adding anything uh, important to the to the work. Uh, so I just basically tried to stick with the with the things that I thought were just key elements of the of of this experience I wanted to to produce. And this is very interesting because for example at the at the piece of the mattress factory you just saw um, there were a lot of people that were saying uh, uh, hey, we, we we really like it, the sound you you put into the piece and and actually there was no sound, but the sounds were the actual sounds of the space. And, and it's interesting how you can generate a certain uh, state where maybe you enhance uh, the perception of, of who is looking and just making uh, that person look at the same space uh, he or she is used to see all the time with different eyes. And and that's very interesting because it's not that much about producing new things, but about reorienting the focus or or the sensitivity. You know? And uh, it's really subtle, but it's I think it's it can be much more powerful in terms of the final experience you you have uh, with with these or any other work. Um, yeah, I don't know. This looks like it's stopped. Um, so, for example, with, with this, this thing with sound, it, it, it's it's just that they were really just paying attention to the sound that was in that room, and and hearing the 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 wood cracking and the the pipes maybe with water coming down. I 
I want to, well, the, the, I have a lot of like this kind of medium, small scale interventions in, in interiors. They are, I have worked with this in really a large amount of different types of spaces from, from more uh, normal buildings to, to the white cube, the, the, the gallery space. Even with objects, also that all, again they were found just in the storage room of the of the gallery, uh, more industrial spaces, small scale elements also, and uh, large scale buildings. You're probably uh, when this was done in in 2008. Um, well, at that well, I mean, it's it's you're probably very tired already of seeing building projections, so I'm not going to to and but I, for me it was uh, actually I, I kind of started not avoiding but trying to to go more into a more intimate scale. Uh, I'm I'm not interested at all into spectacle or, or trying to push that. I'm kind of going in the opposite direction and. And this this uh, this project had uh, for me had a lot of sense in the sense that he was really working. This uh, this was a, a building by Richard Meyer. The, it's the same. You probably can tell it's very similar to the to the the Getty and in, with these panels. Not but I think they are aluminium panels that uh, uh, sandwich panels that are modulating the whole building and. Well, basically, I was just trying to work with that module and uh, through light and shadow, in this case, trying to open up new new openings, close uh, others, work with light. How would be if, if light would be, um, uh, like you would project again a time lapse uh, or improbable positions of the sun uh, in, in within that building. I want to show another another project that it's quite different, but I think uh, it's quite different in the medium. And for me, it actually has opened new paths to to all this that may seem very or um, uh, or different in in the sense of the tools I'm using, but um, but. Uh, well, I think it's it's pretty. I think also probably uh, at the, at the time uh, I was really researching on on site specific work and and the the gallery I was working with in in Madrid uh, they they wanted me to do a, a show there and when you work site specific like a gallery space is like the the worst place you can work with because it's everything you, the white cubes everything is white uh, everything is actually the aim of the white cube is to to make it as neutral as possible so it's difficult to find elements that can really that you can really push forward so I was thinking about this these ideas uh, uh, of site specificity at that time I was there's a, an artist that you probably all know very well uh, Michael Asher that I really like and I think he's really elegant in the way he he works he worked with uh, site specificity and probably you can see some connections with with this work there there were some there were a couple of elements that were important in this project one was the 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 use of kind of drawing again but in a space but instead of using projection uh, normally, you use, I work with dark spaces, and I add light to that to those spaces. I project the light, and I draw with the light. In this case, it was uh, the other way around. The white cube is normally a very lighted environment. So what I did instead of adding light, it was removing light with s the most basic possible way, which was uh, with black paint on the wall. So it's really a simple. Uh, project. I'm just going to show uh, So 
So basically, this project also works with time in a very different way. Because normally when you work with, uh, oops, I, I hope you have seen the previous videos, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hope I was not just watching by myself in, in my screen. Okay, that's good. Uh, so the, the, yeah, I think it's, yes. So the, the, when you work with video or with uh, projected light, um, usually the time frame is, uh, or at least my, my work, I usually work with time frames that vary between three to 15 minutes. Th I think that's, that's a good time for, for depending on the scale of the, of the work. But um, uh, the, the fact that I was changing the medium here, it opened up possibilities of working with the time frame in a very different way, and actually working with the time frame of the exhibition itself. So in this case, what I did is I took the, the outlines, the position, and the dimensions of all the, all, all, the art, all the art objects that were exhibited in the gallery in the last three years, and I, uh, I started drawing these uh, outlines on the walls of the gallery, starting from the last exhibition and ending up ending at the at the well. It was I think it was 17 exhibitions, uh, or well, or 19. I don't remember. Um, and going backwards in time. So, and that process of drawing all the exhibitions. Uh, actually lasted the six weeks of the exhibition. So you would, uh, when you arrived at the, at the gallery space the first week, if there was someone coming the first week, what they would see was totally different than the, than the, last, um, than the last week. No? And there was a process of, of, of addition. All the, um, all the material, there was a big process of documentation here. It was actually most of the work was documenting it and later painting it, but uh, documenting it and placing, using the, the, the material that gallery, the gallery had uh, was, uh, you know, like just looking at the photos and there was something interesting because there were some, some parts that they were actually not uh, very clear, or they were not photos, and and actually at some point even the memory of the gallery staff of the individuals were was very useful. So it kind of accessed very different layers of the of the gallery, uh, not just the memory of the space, but also the memory of the people working there. There were some interesting things going on. You would realize that all the structure, in a way, it's also, it was also a map of of the structure of, of how uh, how the the gallerist uh, hangs the, the the different types of, of artworks in the, on the on the walls and you would find in every wall a very clear uh, symmetry uh, it was interesting to see that in some walls there's a tendency to just put one object even if it was small or big and in other ones it was always like in pairs uh, obviously, you would find like uh, a line uh, at the height of the of the eyes that was uh, much more dense because of the yeah of how we uh, the height we, we, we see now. So again, it's 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 a project that it's working with time. In a way, it's working with light or with no light, but uh, that, f yeah, for me, it's 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 a way of addressing not the same issues but similar issues, and they have to do a lot with with perception, but more specifically with how we perceive the the gallery space. There's also well, there, there are many ways you can uh, see this work, no? The, 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 it was interesting to see, for example, how when there was just one, one rendered exhibition at the really uh, beginning, uh, people could 
actually the people who have seen the last exhibition, which is, was the one that was represented, they could actually visualize the, the exhibition. And they could, they could tell you, ah, there there was this piece, and, there were, and it was very interesting that the memory was being activated just by these uh, outlines. And a lot of people would actually recall the, the ex their experience in the exhibition. That was that was something I was not expecting, and and it actually it actually happened. Um, and just uh, the last project I'm going to show is uh, oops is. Um, uh, project that uh, is also dealing with with the again with projection but in a different way I'm, I'm working here with systems mm, structures or how repetition uh, how actual architectural or the interpretation of, of architectural systems could be um, if you translate uh, these systems into time what what happens no? and this is also a site specific work I'm just going to to play the video and maybe we can just open the You should you should tell me something if I if if that happens, please. So I think that's that's all. Thank you, Pablo. 
um, I guess I would like to then open the floor for questions, if anybody has any question. Yes, if you can please talk into the mic because we are recording. Mm -hmm. You had a question, please. <coughs> Um, it's such a wonderful presentation and so uh, great to see your work and um, your ideas, especially about Trump lie and how that works and how to bring that into a contemporary architectural setting or even a not contemporary architectural setting. And I'm curious to know about the movement associated and is it do you think of it in terms of natural light or in terms of like an artificial movement? But it all seems to be quite slow and to have a you know, very particular quality. So I'm, I'm just you're like to hear about your. You're thinking about the movement of the, the viewer or the movement of the work? The movement of the work. The projection the itself or. And the timing of that, and, and it's a very, I mean, for me, it looks sometimes like sunlight, and sometimes it looks like a scan, like a kind of a robotic scan, and I'm just curious to know where you stand on that. For me, it's more about, um, um, like, <coughs> usually these pieces are suggesting possibilities of that space, like, what if uh, that space could happen this or that, or there's a transformation going on in that space. And the the rhythm, I think it has to do also with, so when you're looking at it, you have time to adapt to what's happening. Mm -hmm. And again, the this process of adaptation, you, you start uh, building a sort of mental image and getting used to, to things that maybe are not there, but you're psychologically getting adapt and most of the works have a point where there's a silence and there's black. So you face actually the back, the real space. And that's really an interesting moment because it's like, uh, it's like you, all these things that you have been building in your mind about that space suddenly disappear and you're faced back to, to you're faced with, uh, with the, the space that was there before. And, and you look at it in a different way. And so I think there's kind of a rhythm in all the works of building up and, mm -hmm. and probably this kind of quiet rhythm, it has to do with, with letting you adapt to what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Also, I was, what I, I was mentioning before, for me it's important to give you room to, to think about what you're seeing. If you over, uh, if you over uh, overwhelm all the senses with uh, with a lot of sensory input, you don't have. There's this marketing theory, I think, that for presentations, uh, uh, like advertising companies to present projects to clients, they would do use uh, sound, uh, video. They will use as much as information as possible because when you over overstimulate the brain with a lot of things, you, you lose your capacity to judge what you're seeing. You, you're, so obviously they, would, they don't want to be judged, they just want to, to, to convince someone. So and I'm, I'm, I want the opposite. I want to give room so people can actually reflect and see and, and think about what they are seeing. Thank you so much for the great uh, presentation. I didn't, and you're my really biggest inspiration. And like I think mo for most of the people and who are using light as a medium. And thank you. And I, I mean, during the presentation and also preparation of our show, I we uh, just spoke about it. During the uh, preparation, you had a really great concern about uh, shows and exhibitions and festivals. I don't think I can give any any advice. That's a very personal 
Interesting. Uh, I think it's a very personal, I mean, every artist has their own path and, and someone maybe would be driven to more, uh, I don't know, more to, to, to ideas and others. I, I don't think it's really possible to, to give advice. I, for me, it's more, uh, what is important is to find your, what are you really interested, what are you doing with your, with your work. Uh, this idea of projection is just a tool. It's like, it's like drawing or it's like sculpting in wood or it's like, it's just a tool. So, and you can use this tool for many different things. So it's just a matter of, of finding what you really want to, to do with it. And, and if either way, just uh, follow it. I like, um, yeah, I don't know if I, I uh, yeah, I kind of, I can, I, I feel reflected in, in what you're saying in a way. Maybe I don't articulate it the same way, but uh, that there's, I mean, Berson, I think, is really, really in interesting, uh, and not just by the, uh, for example, there's there's something about the the quality of of light. We are used to see light and video as a as a frame that transport us to another <coughs> reality, identified with the with the objective of the camera. And and it's 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 surprising that video is being used the same way as painting in 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 this sense. And I'm, I'm more interested in what happens when you use light to, to just break the frame and take this idea of working with time that you can do with film and video inside that we are used to in, inside a frame. This, uh, but we, we lose when we, when we are in, in a cinema or just watching TV. Uh, we lose, uh, these devices are, t are designed to, to make us lose or uh, or body perception. So what I'm, I, th I think it's important in my work, and I'm really trying to push, is to bring back from the from the from inside the frame, and bring back to reality. So it's it's a th there was an exhibition I, I I did a work in that it was called uh, the whole exhibition was called um, uh, virtual reality, uh, sorry uh, real virtuality. Uh, so the normal term is virtual reality. So they were just uh, uh, did the opposite thing, and I, I think it's interesting in the sense that it's like bringing the virtual instead of trying to, to, you know, we are used to experience things, virtual things in a screen, in a display. I'm, I think I'm really like the idea to just go 
to the origins of light in a way, in the sense of how light works actually, and think how you can take out of the frame and really work with with the physicality of light, which in the end is is Bergson. He he speaks a lot about how uh, well about how perception is a way of selecting in a way how and it's a way of selecting. Uh, well, we could be here talking about Bergson about for a while, but yeah, I think it's <coughs> you pointed a good direction. Um, thank you again, and uh, I enjoyed that you uh, prefaced your your work by describing the fundamentals of light. I had a question, and that is, do you prefer to describe color in terms of uh, reality or perception? Because there certainly is a an element of reality given the material properties of light, but there's also a lot of subjectivity uh, in the way that people receive color, so how do you mediate that? What's the balance between, between those two well, forces? As you can see, I, I haven't found yet the right way to work with color. I'm, I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, most of the works, uh, well, all of the works are really basically uh, working with this idea of, of contrast, of light and shadow, which I understand is, is, is how we visually uh, define volume, so I'm I'm working on, s on some ideas that relate to color, but uh, so far I, I yeah I haven't found the the something that really uh, interests me enough to to really push uh, to use color. Um, I think color. I think the reason probably is color has to do less with the structure of things with the structure of a space. It has a different quality, probably it's, it's related to, to what you were seeing, how people interpret color in, it's more subjective, it's, it can be understood uh, uh, in different ways, it can affect maybe more the mood or, but it's not that much about the inner structure of, of things, no? how things are kind of built. It's like, uh, I think color, in this case, the, the parallels would be I'm, 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 I'm drawing in a space and using color would be painting, right? So in, in a way, well, it's not that simple, but uh, so at this moment, I'm more concerned about the structure than, than about maybe a more uh, phenomenological uh, uh, kind of uh, experience. Thank you. projectors or using lasers? They are all, sorry, I probably I, I, I should have a, sometimes, you know, I give for granted that, but they are, they are, uh, uh, proje they're normal video projectors. Uh, uh, I think in all the cases, they are, they are normal video projectors. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a matter of uh, using video and then really adjusting carefully the projection you're doing placing it and and really um, uh, well with with uh, with mostly digital tools different kind of programs uh, adjusting really the projection you're doing to the precise uh, architectural elements that you are projecting on on top of um, something for me that it's interesting is that I use uh, now probably the range of software you have is much more wide, but I mostly keep using the, the, the things I was using in when I started doing this kind of works in 2007, where there was not really specific tools for, for it. And it, they are mostly architectural. Uh, my background is, is in architecture, so I started uh, using these CAD programs, 3D programs that were used to visualize, to project architecture uh, before it was built or 
to, to explain architecture to others in order to be built. And I find interesting that I'm using or these same kind of tools not to build architecture physically, but to build it perceptually in a, in a way, no? to draw it in a space. You yeah, took my second question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for coming. Thank